right, so we're going to begin the talk now. And if you have um, anything to say, just, just so you know, while I'm speaking through the slideshow, I actually can't see um, anything else but my slideshow. So just be aware of that so that if you um, need anything, please pop, pop it in the chat box. Um, we have someone online from Denera who will be able to help you out if there's a concern um, from, the, from the Zoom point of view, okay? All right. Oh, I wonder if I can... I'm just going to change something because it's going to get in the way of my chat. How do I move that? I think, I think that will be all right. All right, so welcome to this morning's talk um, called Future Proof Your Pelvic Floor. Um, my name is Jessica Teager. I'm a pelvic health physiotherapist from Sydney Pelvic Clinic in Bondi Junction. And I'd firstly like to thank Denera for giving me the opportunity to talk to you this morning about a topic that I'm really passionate about. Um, so I'm, I'm passionate about empowering both men and women with the knowledge to better understand their bodies and to reduce the amount of taboo there is about pelvic conditions, including incontinence, prolapse, and sexual dysfunction. So we're covering a lot of topics today, and my mission is not to bring fear, but rather to equip you with the knowledge of what might be going on and how you can help yourself or where you might go to, to get some help. At the end, um, I'm going to try and leave some time for questions. So if you have a question throughout the talk, please write it down in the chat box. Um, and I think you have the opportunity to send it privately or publicly across the chat. And at the end of the talk, um, we'll start to address some of those questions. Um, just so that you know you are on mute and you will remain on mute for now, but when it comes to question time, you can then have a chance to take yourself off mute if you want to ask a question. So when I began thinking about this topic um, of future-proofing your pelvic floor, um, a lady popped into my mind, a past patient. So she was actually someone who was attending the clinic, but having massage at our clinic. So she wasn't a physio patient. She was a massage patient. Um, but she told the massage therapist when she came in, just so you know, I might need to rush off to the toilet um, during this massage because I'm having this problem where I get really urgent and I just have to go. And the massage therapist um, said to her, you know, I think it's time to have a pelvic um, physiotherapy assessment. And so she did book in to see me um, the following week. And she was a lady in her mid sixties. She was going through a bit of a stressful time. She'd just recently gone through a separation, um, but she was really enjoying her weekly date with her granddaughter. So she would take her granddaughter in the stroller down to the cafe and they'd have a baby Chino together. And this was something that really brought her a lot of joy every week. Um, but unfortunately, what she had noticed was after um, a while that after this baby Chino, or she'd have, have her coffee and her granddaughter would have the baby Chino, she was noticing that she had this overwhelming urge that she had to rush to the toilet. And not only that, but she was starting to not make it there on time. So she had this overwhelming urge and then she would leak on the way to the toilet. And it was really upsetting her to the point where she started to think she may not continue these weekly dates with her granddaughter to have their coffee and baby Chino. And when I heard that, I thought, that just, that can't be the answer. You can't put your life on hold and take away the one thing that you really enjoy in your week because of your bladder. So we worked together on assessing what was going on and kind of listening to what her symptoms were and we came up with a plan. We only had a few treatment sessions actually. Um, it was more about giving her some ideas around how to manage the problem. 
and she she was great so she we treated her she got better and she could go to the you know coffee shop and she didn't have to even think twice about where the next toilet was so it was just a really nice um patient outcome and it made me think that this is a really important talk because we want to make sure that you're not giving up things in your life that bring you joy um, because of your bladder or because of your bowel. So hopefully that introduces you to where we're going to go today. So here we talk about how do I need to think about my pelvic health? I think I've already started to demonstrate uh, that for that woman, um, that she was having her massages and she wasn't thinking about her pelvic health, but her pelvic health was really important um, at that point in her life. So we know that one in three aged care admissions are due to incontinence alone. Um, so that very fact should explain why it's really important as we age that we think about our pelvic health. Um, because it could actually be part of the reason you um, can't be living at home on your own anymore. Um, and I think that um, is something that people do worry about as they get older. Um, and this is something that you actually have control over. We also know that urinary incontinence affects 13% of men and 37% of women. And 70% of those are not seeking advice and treatment for their problem. So that blows my mind as a pelvic physio because we're here to help you. Um, but yeah, 70% of people are not getting help and maybe just accepting that that's the way it has to be. And it absolutely isn't. So these statistics, you know, show you that incontinence is common, um, but I want to tell you it's also treatable. So let's have a look at that soon. So before we begin, I just wanted to set the scene. Um, there are three major parts in your life that will influence your pelvic floor. So firstly, we call it foundations. So these are our genetics, how we're born, what our parents had in their genes. It also includes things like the choices of sport, like did you choose to be a gymnast or did you choose to be a rugby player? So how heavy or um, how much um, effort was required of your pelvic floor as um, in your youth. It also includes your body weight and if you have an increase in body weight over your uh, youth and lifetime. The next area is more about women. So it's about women who've undergone pregnancy and birth and particularly a vaginal delivery. So at this point in a woman's life, um, there are very big changes that happen to the connective tissue and the muscles inside the pelvis. And actually the pelvis itself widens or broadens out. So you might notice changes at that time in your life during either pregnancy and postnatally. However, there's no hard and fast rule. We can see women delivering big babies and having no pelvic floor dysfunction or we can see average size babies, but the woman suffers large pelvic floor problems. So we think genetics play a role here um, and um, we need to consider pregnancy and birth as part of the big influence on our pelvic floor. And then finally, aging. <laughs> so getting older is the last part of this major life stage that influences the pelvic floor. So things like changes in hormones, particularly menopause, um, constipation. So if you've had a lifetime of straining or pushing on the toilet, um, and that tends to get worse with aging. Um, obesity, so having a lot of body weight down through your pelvis. Medical issues, so something like diabetes might change the way the nerves are actually supplying your pelvic floor. Chronic bronchitis or a chronic cough. So if you're constantly coughing, um, that puts a lot of pressure down on your pelvic floor. And finally, what occupation you had. So did you have a heavy lifting occupation, a repetitive occupation that might have caused um, more pressure through the pelvic floor over your lifetime. 
So I'd like to just run through the topics we're going to cover today. So number one, what is the pelvic floor? Maybe some of you are already wondering that. So we'll go through that straight away. Menopause and how it affects the pelvic floor. Incontinence in women, prolapse, incontinence in men. Sexual health for men and women. A pelvic floor assessment and what that is. And then some lifestyle and advice um, around how you can improve these things that we talk about. Okay, so what is the pelvic floor? Now, here is the pelvis. Hopefully you can see my cursor. We've got the iliac bones or the iliums. And these are what, if you put your hands on your hips, you feel these sides of the bones here. We have the ball and socket joint of the hip. And this is where the leg connects into the pelvis. And then we have this space inside here, this white space, and it's actually empty. So there's nothing bony inside this space. What you're seeing at the back here is the sacrum and the coccyx, um, but that's at the back of the pelvis. So inside this white area is empty space, but it's not empty, is it? It's got lots of muscle layer. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and just show you that now. So let me work that out, stop share. Okay, so hopefully you're looking at me now. So this is the pelvis that we just looked at. So we've got our iliums, we've got um, the at the back, the sacrum, the coccyx at the bottom. And as you can see, inside these bones is the pelvic floor, the muscles of the pelvic floor. Okay, so all the red is muscle. So what's really important to know is that if we didn't have all this muscle, there'd be an empty space at the base of the pelvis and everything would drop through the middle. So it's really, really important. So it's probably crazy that we haven't thought about it a lot um, because it, it is so important to holding all our bits in, in place. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Let me go back to sharing my screen. Ooh. Here we go, where do I share it? Um, da, da, da. Okay, I think we're gonna be good. All right, here we go. Just let me find my screen, done. Okay, so the pelvic uh, floor, um, as I said, fills in this space down here with all that red muscle. So, you can think about the pelvic floor as having several different functions. So firstly, it's there for organ support, okay? So we talked about how inside the pelvis are the muscles, sitting on top inside this area um, are the organs, all right? And I'll, I'll talk you through that in a minute a little bit more. The pelvic floor keeps us continent, okay? So it means that if we don't want to pass urine or if we don't want to pass wind, let's say you're in a public place and you, you know, feel some gas, but you don't want to pass it. The thing that stops you is your pelvic floor muscles. Control over those muscles to stop that coming out when you don't want it to. The pelvic floor also needs to be able to relax to allow the passage of urine or a bowel motion. Okay, so we need it to be able to switch on to stop and we need it to let go so that we can actually pass urine or pass a bowel motion. It also has um, a role in sexual function. So for a man, having um, pelvic floor, um, having a normal pelvic floor will mean that you can have an erection. For women, the pelvic floor needs to relax to allow for penetration. And in both when men and women, the pelvic floor has a role in orgasm. So really important structures. And finally, the pelvic floor also has a core function whereby it stabilizes the pelvis for movement. And we're going to try and address that a little bit later. Um, we might get up off our chairs and try something a little bit later. So what I wanted to do was just think about how can we do a pelvic floor contraction? And we're going to do a few of these throughout the session today. But I think if I asked you to contract your bicep muscle, I think most people would, you know, pop their arm out and 
squeeze their arm and make their bicep puff up. Okay, so we know to have a contraction, we need to shorten the muscle and feel it contract. But the pelvic floor, we can't see. Okay, so we can't actually detect just by looking whether it's on or whether it's off. So what I want you to do, we're gonna try and work out how to feel our pelvic floor. So I want you to sit in your chair, put your hands on your hips and rock your pelvis under so that you're kind of slouching in your chair and then roll the other way and sit up extra tall in your chair. Do it again, rock all the way back and then all the way forward. And now find a halfway point between those two positions. Okay, so we're not tucked all the way under, we're not all the way forward, we're halfway. And what you should hopefully have here is that your perineum is in contact with the chair underneath you. So you should feel between the front passage and the back passage, the chair is sitting in the middle on the, on the perineum. So now what I want you to do is think about if you were going to stop urine. So imagine you were midstream on the toilet and you wanted to stop the urine coming out. What would you do? How could you lift and squeeze internally to stop urine? And just have a think, could you feel your perineum lift up away from the chair? So that's what we're looking for. Another one might be holding back gas. So if you felt like you needed to pass some gas, but it just wasn't the right time, holding that in. And again, you might notice when you do that, that you're lifting your perineum slightly up away from the chair. It's not gonna lift off the chair, but you should feel it contract away from the chair, okay? Up towards your head, okay? So that is a pelvic floor contraction, and we're going to talk a lot more about that. Um, but that's a good introduction to what that is. But what you should know is that in a study um, of actually physiotherapists, so they got a whole bunch of physios together and they said, squeeze your pelvic floor. Um, only 30% of them did the right thing, okay? So only a third of the physios in the room were able to switch on their pelvic floor correctly, okay? So that means that what I'm telling you verbally may not actually mean that you're able to do the right contraction. Um, so hopefully we can perfect that over today, but you might wanna come in and get it checked just to make sure you're doing the right thing because we know statistically people can't follow that instruction and necessarily produce the correct contraction. Okay, so this is a side on view of the pelvis. Here is the pubic bone at the front. Here is the sacrum and the coccyx at the back. Okay, so front on this side, back on this side. This is the female pelvis. So we have the bladder at the front coming down through the pelvic floor as a urethra. We have the uterus coming down as the vagina through the pelvic floor. And then we have the rectum coming down through the pelvic floor, turning into the anus, okay? In this picture, I want you to imagine that the pelvic floor is like a hammock, okay? A nice tight hammock, lifting everything up nice and high in the pelvis. That is what we want. That's what we refer to as a normal pelvic floor. However, things might happen such as a pregnancy, a vaginal delivery, increasing your body weight, having a chronic cough, and then our beautiful hammock that usually keeps nice and lifted in the pelvis starts to drop or droop down okay and so if we have these changes in our lifetime or even not lifetime even if you have a you know birth and then you think you've recovered you might notice down the track that you're starting to have pelvic floor problems and it's related to this weakened pelvic floor which physically drops lower and it means that these organs are not in their ideal position anymore, okay? So let's have a little think about menopause because it has a really important role in the pelvis. So most of you will know that menopause can 
be a gradual process and can take between two and six years to be completed. And we make the diagnosis of menopause when it's 12 months after your last menstrual period. So you might think you're there and then, oh, here's another period and then you've got to wait another 12 months to be considered um, menopausal. The main feature of menopause is a significant drop in estrogen. And this leads to a range of symptoms in the body, including the pelvic floor. So the loss of estrogen is known as the genitourinary syndrome of menopause. So I don't know if you've heard that before, but it actually has a title, the GSM. And this means that there are symptoms found in the vulva, the pelvic floor, the bladder, the urethra, and also sexual dysfunction following the drop in estrogen. So these things might be a thinning of the tissues around the vulva or little tears. You might notice incontinence when you cough or sneeze. You might notice that you're more urgent to get to the toilet. It can affect your bowels and make you feel more constipated and lead to straining. Um, or you might notice heaviness or bulging in the vagina, which is often a sign of prolapse. So pelvic physiotherapy um, is really important for people who are noticing signs of this GSM. We're skilled and capable of addressing these changes. And it's really important that you seek help because it shouldn't be something that you accept as part of the aging process. Um, it really, we have a lot of chance to change these problems um, associated with menopause. So let's talk a little bit more about these problems a bit more individually. So incontinence, there are different kinds of incontinence and it's important for us to know which kind it is. So stress urinary incontinence is the leakage of urine from increased intra-abdominal pressure. So activities like coughing, sneezing, increase the pressure in your abdomen. And if that pressure exceeds the closing pressure of your urethra or your pelvic floor, then the urine can leak out. So what's really important here is to recognize that if we can strengthen and close off the urethra against the pressure of a cough or sneeze, we can become continent again. And pelvic floor strengthening is the first line treatment in preventing and treating stress urinary incontinence. And it can cure 80% of those who are leaking from stress urinary incontinence. So you have the chance to improve and treat this um, and 80% of women and men fix it just with pelvic floor strengthening. Now, urge urinary incontinence is when you have this sudden overwhelming urge that you have to rush to the toilet to empty your bladder. It can create a lot of fear and stress in someone's life. And um, often after experiencing this urgency, um, people start to mention that they actually can't make it to the toilet on time. So it might begin with this overwhelming urge and then over time it turns into an urge that ends up um, turning into bladder leakage, okay? Now, urgency um, is a little bit more tricky than stress urinary incontinence. There are more things that contribute to this diagnosis. So it's really important if that's what's bothering you, if you notice that it's, it's not just the cough or sneeze, it's really this sudden need to empty my bladder and I can't stop myself. If that is happening to you, um, I wouldn't necessarily begin my pelvic floor strengthening exercises yet. Um, I would be seeking some advice from a physio first uh, because there are more things at play usually in this diagnosis. It's also important to consider um, if you have any bladder irritants that might be contributing to your urgency. Things like drinking coffee or caffeine in tea, fizzy drinks of any type, doesn't matter about the sugar, it's the bubbles, that fizziness that affects the bladder, um, or alcohol. So 
those things are known as bladder irritants and they can further increase your urgency. And then we have mixed incontinence, which means you've got a bit of both. So you have some stress urinary incontinence and you have some urge urinary incontinence. And it's really important that we work out which one you have and which one we're going to treat first. All right, so pelvic organ prolapse is when one of the pelvic organs or more descend toward the vagina. It's very common and over 50% of women develop some degree of pelvic organ prolapse in their lifetime. However, not all of them are bothered by it or feel it, okay? So it might be there on examination, but they don't have any symptoms of this prolapse. However, if you are symptomatic, that is when we need to do something about it um, because you don't need to be, you don't have to be symptomatic. Some of the risk factors for pelvic organ prolapse is age, a vaginal birth, particularly one that includes forceps, or birthing a baby more than four kilos, or multiple vaginal births, so having three kids. Um, genetics, so if your mother or your grandmother had a prolapse, that might mean you're more likely to have one. Constipation, so that straining and pushing down on the pelvic floor. Um, and being overweight, so increase in body weight will increase the pressure down into the pelvic floor and on the pelvic organs dropping down. So the common signs and symptoms of pelvic organ prolapse is a heaviness or dragging feeling inside the vagina, not being able to completely empty your bladder or bowel. So for example, if you sit down and do your wee, and then you get up and you think, oh, there's still a little bit more there. So if you feel like you need to sit back down and do what we call a double void, that could indicate prolapse. It could indicate other things too, but it could indicate prolapse. Um, a feeling of fullness or a bulge in the vagina. Um, it, here we have lower back pain. That, that is because a lot of people with prolapse mention lower back pain, but I wouldn't say it's a direct sign. Um, but if you notice these bulging symptoms and you have lower back pain, it may be telling you something about it. And a discomfort in the vagina with more activity. So often you won't feel it in the morning, but by the afternoon when you've done a bit of walking around, shopped at the supermarket, brought your shopping bags in from the car, after all that activity, you might start to feel it. And it's more of a discomfort or a bother than it is pain. So we don't associate pelvic, pelvic organ prolapse with pain, but rather it's just, just annoying. I can just feel something there that I shouldn't feel. But the good thing is there is certainly treatment and ways to manage it. The first one is pelvic, or, uh, pelvic floor strengthening. I'm sure you're surprised to hear that. Um, so pelvic floor strengthening, because remember we talked about our hammock and if our hammock is droopy, then the organs are gonna droop down to, they're gonna sit lower in the pelvis. But if we strengthen our hammock, our pelvic floor, we bring it up higher and that lifts the organs back up again. There is also the option of using a silicon device called a pessary, and they are a wonderful way to help support the organs and keep everything lifted up. Um, so if you're thinking you might need a little bit of help there, um, please you know, contact me and we can talk about some options. All right, moving on to male pelvic health for a little bit. Um, I, I did notice a few men on, on the um, Zoom today. So thanks for joining me, men. And the other thing is most women will, you know, have a male partner who they can pass on the information to if they couldn't nag them enough to watch the Zoom today. Um, but the prevalence of incontinence is in men um, is strongly associated with prostate disease. And we know that prostate disease increases as you age. So 30% of men aged 70 to 84 will have urinary incontinence. And by the time they're 85, 50% of men will have urinary incontinence. So it's a really important thing to consider 
um, men when we're talking about incontinence. It's not just a woman's problem. Now, post-prostatectomy incontinence occurs in 87% of cases. So it's highly likely if a man has to have surgery on the prostate that he will leak urine afterwards. There have been studies which show that if you begin pelvic floor muscle training before the surgery, two to four weeks prior to the surgery, you decrease the amount of time you're leaking after the surgery and up to six months postoperatively. So it's a really good idea if you're expecting to have a prostate surgery that you come in for just one consultation before so that we make sure you know how to do your pelvic floor exercises. Um, that is gonna be the thing that most protects you from incontinence after your surgery. The other things that can happen is urinary frequency and urgency. So that same kind of going all the time and rushing to the toilet, worrying you might not make it on time. And also what we call post-micturition dribble, which is when you empty your bladder and then you go to leave and a little bit more dribbles out and it's quite annoying. Um, and that is another problem that we can help with um, for male pelvic health. So in this little picture, you can see we have the bladder here and the bladder has the urethra coming down into the penis, okay? But around the urethra is the prostate and the pelvic floor. So it only seems like sensible, I'd say, that if you're having something done between your bladder and your prostate, that the pelvic floor is going to be affected too. So if we have to go into the pelvis, we're going to affect the pelvic floor. And not only that, but if we want to help control loss of urine and we've done something surgically at the prostate, then we need to do something here with the pelvic floor to support against the changes that have happened just above it. Okay, so um, hopefully you can spread the word to your um, male friends um, about pelvic floor physio before their surgery. I think they'll, they'll thank you later. Now, male pelvic pain, um, let's talk a little bit about that. It's quite an unwelcome shock for men when they notice uh, symptoms of pelvic dysfunction and pain. Um, because there's not much public or professional awareness about it. It affects one in 12 men, and unfortunately, it often gets misdiagnosed or incorrectly managed. Pelvic pain means anything in the pelvis, including the perineum, rectum, and genitals. So the man might have pain when they're sitting, they might have a pressure throbbing or tingling or burning sensation in their pelvis, including the penis, testicles or the rectum. They might have pain when they empty their bowels. Um, they might have frequency where they're rushing to the toilet very often to try and alleviate this pain. They might have sexual pain, so pain um, with um, intercourse or with ejaculation. And unfortunately, these syndromes are often accompanied by poor mental health, so anxiety, depression, and high levels of stress, because I think men don't really talk about this very much, and it also is not very well understood um, by just your general doctor. So what can we do for these men? Well, what we know is that pelvic floor muscle um, training for men can help improve erectile function. So you've heard of erectile dysfunction, but did you know that by using your pelvic floor muscles to strengthen them up, that actually can help with erectile dysfunction? Um, and the great thing about that is that it doesn't require any medication, so there's no nasty side effects on your body. Um, pelvic floor muscle training can also improve your um, ability to hold on Okay, so avoid premature ejaculation and it also can help ejaculation. So some men have um, like a dysfunction with their ability to ejaculate. So pelvic floor has m multiple functions here um, and it needs to be considered in these problems. So for the men online today, we're gonna try a pelvic floor contraction together now, a little bit different to the way I explained it earlier. 
So for men, I want you to still do that little rock forward and back in your chair. Find your halfway point, okay? Feel the perineum sitting on the chair with you. But this time I want you to think about lifting up through the scrotum and testicles. So try and lift those up away from the chair and then let them come back down and drop back down. So you might liken that to, you know, walking into cold water and you kind of whoop, lift everything up. Another um, way to switch on the pelvic floor in men, and it's actually a really important one for post prostatectomy um, patients, is the idea of shortening or retracting the penis. So I want you to think in your mind, what muscles would you use to kind of shorten the penis toward you, shorten back? And that is also a pelvic floor muscle contraction. And that's really important for continence, that one, okay? So again, um, really important to address this if you're noticing that you're one of those men in the category um, that have incontinence. We're going to move back to women now and sexual symptoms found in women. So some of the um, symptoms that women might notice is vaginal dryness, painful sex, both on entry and deeper, a loss of libido, and loss of or pain with orgasm. So again, all of these things are important to address and not just accept as something that happens when you get older. Um, they, they can be addressed quite well with pelvic physio and help from the doctor possibly for um, some estrogen replacement. So the way that pelvic physio addresses sexual dysfunction in both men and women um, include treating pelvic floor muscle tightness. So if the muscles are too tight, they will not have good blood flow. So we do that with manual therapy. It is also really important if you have had gynecological radiation treatment for gynecological cancer, that you address um, the pelvic floor and the tissues around the vagina, um, because unfortunately they will be affected by the radiation. Um, and so that's really important that we see you if you're one of those people. We help you to learn how to relax your pelvic floor and we can use biofeedback or down training and relaxation techniques for that. And we can provide advice around returning to sex at the right time, lubricants, positions, and whether we think you need to see your doctor for a prescription of, of something else. And we'll talk, that will come up right at the end of the talk. Not, not a lot on it, but we'll mention that later. So how do we look at the pelvic floor? How do we assess it? A good place to start is an ultrasound assessment. So the picture here, picture A, um, you can see here the bladder. It's a kind of square shape and in here is all the urine. All right, so the bladder is the square. The black space inside is the urine. And this X at the bottom is marking the point of the base of the bladder. And the base of the bladder is where the pelvic floor sits. Now, if we look at part B, you can notice that the base of the bladder has lifted up and it almost forms like a little bridge. Okay, so you can imagine a little harbour bridge here. And that means that the person has contracted their pelvic floor. So when their pelvic floor is relaxed, the base is flat. And when the pelvic floor is contracted, the base lifts up. Okay, so that's how we can detect a pelvic floor contraction through ultrasound. But remember, we said that only 30% of people do this correctly. So if we're not seeing any change on the ultrasound, if we say squeeze your pelvic floor and it looks like this picture the whole time, we might need to look a little bit further. We might need to check things a little bit more detail uh, with more detail because um, we're not seeing a change on the ultrasound. So if that happens, then we recommend an internal pelvic floor assessment. So what that means is that we will go internally to feel how the muscles are contracting and holding. So given that the pelvic floor muscles are directly responsible for continence, it makes sense that if we need to assess your continence, we're going to assess the pelvic floor. And 
we do this with a high level of professionalism and reassurance, but it's really important that we, we do it properly. Um, and research has found that having an internal assessment of the muscles is more effective um, than just looking at the ultrasound. And I think I've explained why. So think about if you feel you do need an assessment, um, whether you'd be um, open to that internal pelvic floor assessment. And of course, we can talk to you a lot more about that at the time. But, you know, we want you to set up good habits for the rest of your life. And that's important um, to make sure that you set, set the habit up correctly in the first place. Okay, so I don't know if many of you know about the Continents Foundation of Australia, but every year they run an annual campaign. And this year, their campaign was called Invest in Continents. And what they wanted people to do is think about and invest in the continents of their bladder and bowel, especially for the aging population. They discussed five healthy habits, which we're going to go through now. And their goal was to try and prevent incontinence in the aging population. So not only treat, but actually prevent it. So it was a really timely um, campaign because I was setting up this talk and I thought it'd be a really good time to share um, their their thoughts and my thoughts on this. So habit one is stay active. I think it's no secret that physical activity is really important, um, but you might not have thought about it being important for your bladder and bowel function, but it certainly is. So you want to aim for about 30 minutes of physical activity each day, but it doesn't have to all be at once. You can break it up into little segments such as gardening or cleaning, playing with your grandchildren, walking up the stairs, shopping, pushing the trolley. These are all times of activity, um, but it's really important that you do stay active. Sometimes you'll, you'll know that you used to do these things, but you've, you might have stopped. So I think it's important to consider why you stopped. Was it that you had a surgery? Did you have those hot flushes and it just made you give up on exercise? Were you or are you feeling fatigued? And if there are specific reasons that you might have stopped exercising, it's important to consult someone who has the expertise in the area, like a physio or an exercise physiologist, so that they can put together a plan for you to get you back towards exercise. Exercise is so important. It increases your bone mass and prevents osteoporosis, which is important for the aging population. It improves your cardiorespiratory function, helps with your weight, and importantly, it improves your mood and decreases stress and depression. It's also been proven to reduce low back pain and it can improve your sleep. And all of these things are problems that people in the aging population have. So exercise is really important. So I encourage you to do the things that you enjoy. Go dancing, garden, try some yoga or Pilates, take your dog for a walk, um, see your friends, join a local group that are active together. Now a low fiber diet uh, can lead to constipation, hemorrhoids, problems along the digestive tract, overweight and obesity, it contributes to heart disease, diabetes and colon cancer. So habit number two is eat well, but with particular focus on fiber. So fiber is really important in the aging population because the digestive system slows down with age. So we need to counter that with a high fiber diet. Fiber can be found in multigrain breads and cereals, fruits and veggies. And obviously I'm not a dietitian, so this isn't my area of expertise, but um, I often find that if we suggest that people add some psyllium husk to their cereals or smoothies, that's a really great way to increase your fiber intake. And what you want to do is think about if you're having to strain or push on the toilet or if your stool is not a nice formed kind of smooth sausage shape, if it's kind of more like little rabbit droppings, um, then you certainly need to increase your fiber. And 
And equally, we need to drink enough fluid. So if we're increasing our fiber intake, we have to also increase our fluid intake. All right, fiber and fluid work together. Um, we can't have a lot, a lot of one without a lot of the other. Now, some people I think try to decrease their fluids to control their incontinence, um, but this is not a good idea. Okay, so if you have less fluid in your diet, then the urine that is in your bladder will be more concentrated and that becomes an irritant to your bladder. So just like we said, caffeine, fizzy drinks and alcohol irritate your bladder, so does concentrated urine. So you want to keep your fluid intake up enough that you are not irritating your bladder purely from decreasing your fluid intake. Okay, habit number four, exercise your pelvic floor. So having a strong pelvic floor is your insurance policy against incontinence. You can do it anywhere, anytime. No one knows you're doing it. No one can see that you're doing it, um, but it's really important. So we're gonna talk a little bit more now about that. So pelvic floor exercises have level 1A evidence as the first line therapy for incontinence. So what does that mean? If you have incontinence, the first thing you need to try is pelvic floor muscle strengthening, okay? Um, there's nothing else I should have to say more than that. Um, and we're gonna do some pelvic floor squeezes very soon. Same for prolapse, level 1A evidence for reducing the symptomatic sensations of pelvic organ prolapse. So it may not actually make your prolapse go back up, but it will stop you feeling symptomatic or bothered by your prolapse, okay? Um, and that's also really important for people who've had a hysterectomy because the support systems inside the pelvis have changed. So we need to strengthen the pelvic floor and keep everything lifted up and away. So I like to think about pelvic floor contractions kind of like an elevator or a lift. So we have strength, we have insurance, and we have speed. Those are the three kinds of pelvic floor contractions we're going to practice today together. Now for strength, I want you to imagine you're taking your elevator from the ground floor to the top floor, okay? So for strength, it's our super strong, contraction of the pelvic floor, it goes as high as it can. When it comes to endurance, we're only going to lift our elevator halfway up the building, okay? So from the ground floor, halfway, and we're gonna hold it, all right. And for speed, we're not gonna to worry too much about where the elevator is, we're just going to lift it off the ground, drop it back on the ground, lift it off the ground, drop it back down. So we're gonna do all of that together now, so get ready. Okay, so I drew these little graphs to try and help us know what we're doing with our pelvic floor contractions today. So maybe just stand up for a minute, sit back down and check that we have a little bit of contact um, with the seat with our perineum. And then we're going to think about, remember our pelvic floor is like the elevator, it's gonna to go to the top floor for these ones, okay? Are you ready? Breathe in through your nose, breathe out through your mouth. And now lift your pelvic floor all the way up to the top, drop it to the ground floor. All the way to the top floor, drop it down to the ground floor. All the way to the top floor, drop it all the way down. One more, squeeze and lift and let it go. All right, have a little rest. We're gonna do that again. I want you to remember that the feeling that we're thinking of our pelvic floor is a stopping urine stopping wind. So you should feel a lift at the front and the back that come up and lift together towards upwards, towards your head, okay? It should not be pressing down into the chair. It should be lifting up away from the chair. You also should not feel any gripping through your thighs or through your buttocks, all right? Let's try it again. So we're on the ground floor. We're gonna take a breath in, breath out, okay all the way to the top floor, drop it back down to the ground. Squeeze all the way to the top floor, drop it all the way down to the ground. Two more, lift all the way and release. Squeeze and lift and release. Okay, well done. So those are strength 
pelvic floor contractions. Now we have endurance. So for these exercises, you're going to only take our elevator halfway up the building, all right? But we're gonna hold it and you have to breathe while you hold it. All right, so let's breathe in, breathe out. Okay, lift and hold halfway, hold for 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, and let go. All right, now I want you to think, did you have anything to let go of or had you already lost it? If you had lost it, you're gonna squeeze a little bit more again at five seconds, okay? Let's do it again. So squeeze and hold halfway only for 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, squeeze again if you need to, four, three, two, one, and let go. All right, so those are endurance. They should feel different to your strength. And now finally, we have our speed. So with speed, um, it's a quick on, off, on, off, on, off of the pelvic floor. Okay, so I'm gonna try and do that with our cursor, but you can see the way it works here. So you squeeze and lift on, off, on, off, squeeze, release, squeeze, release, squeeze, release, squeeze, release, squeeze, release, squeeze, release. Okay, so that's speed. That can be a little bit tricky if you're not used to doing your pelvic floor exercises, but you will receive at the end of the talk today, actually, I think the email will come in tomorrow morning and we've got these three exercises on there. So check your email tomorrow um, and you'll see these exercises so you can have another practice of them, okay? So I think it's important to be realistic about when you're gonna do these exercises. Compliance is always the hardest part um, in getting someone to do these things. So I'd like to give you some suggestions. You might notice you know when you boil the kettle it just i don't know always for me it takes longer than i thought it should always thinking oh i could be doing so many other things while i'm waiting for this kettle to boil well now you've got something to do you're going to do your pelvic floor squeezes while you wait for the kettle to boil another option is when you're standing in the shower you can do them while you watch tv during the ad breaks um, you can do them while you're standing at the traffic light waiting, you know, to cross the road. Um, another one is every time the phone rings, give your pelvic floor 10 strong squeezes. And then the other thing is we need to make them functional. So it is important to practice these exercises just, you know, whenever, but you also need to use them when you're actually moving. So we're going to practice a pelvic floor squeeze with a cough which is a bit weird during COVID to ask you to cough, but hopefully you're not around anyone else. And so what I want you to do is I want you to lift and hold your pelvic floor on, hold it and go, <coughs> and then let the pelvic floor relax. Let's do it together. So lift and squeeze your pelvic floor, hold it on, cough, cough, <coughs> and then let it go. So that is a functional way of including your pelvic floor in your routine or in your day to prevent urinary incontinence. So if you're someone who leaks with a cough, you need to hold your pelvic floor on during your cough and only let it go when you've finished. Another one is sitting, sit to stand. So getting up out of a chair or even a deep couch, that can often be when people leak urine. So I'd like you to practice that with me now. So I want you to just come back a little bit away from your desk and I want you to squeeze your pelvic floor on and then stand up, let your pelvic floor relax and sit back down. So pelvic floor squeeze and stand up, pelvic floor release and, and sit back down. So another way to functionally include your pelvic floor, so when you get up from the chair, it's on all the way till you're up. Once you're upright, you can let it go and walk around and do your thing. And then finally, we talked about the pelvic floor being important for core stability. So what I thought we'd do, I might stop sharing my screen again, just so I can see everyone. Um, what um, I thought we could do is practice doing a balancing exercise. So I want you to stand up. Everyone's gonna stand up. I don't know, oh, it's not a great view of me. Okay, 
I might try and stand back a little bit. Where can you see me? Okay. All right, so we're gonna stand up and you're going to stand on your right foot. Okay, so stand on your right foot, lift the left leg up, up off the floor. And I want you to now close your eyes and hold for five, four, three, two, one, and then put your foot back down. And now, I hope you can all hear me. And now I want you to do the same thing, but we're gonna do it with our pelvic floor on. So you're gonna stand, stand on your right foot, switch on your pelvic floor, and then close your eyes and hold for five, four, three, two, one, and then let the pelvic floor release. Now, hopefully what you noticed was that with your pelvic floor engaged, you have better balance. Maybe not for everyone, maybe you're not convinced yet, but the pelvic floor actually has stability, a core stability function. So what you might like to do is actually start to use your pelvic floor when you're doing exercises like balance, um, things that are using your core muscles um, because it should actually improve your ability to hold, it, um, hold your body in a stable way. All right, I need to just, um, I need to just share my screen once more, one moment. I'm glad everyone's still here with me. I, could, I can't see you when I'm sharing my screen, but it's great to see everyone's still here. Um, what am I doing? Share screen. Yeah, share. Okay. Oops. Yeah. Okay, so, so what I was saying was we need to think of realistic times when you'll do your pelvic floor exercises and also to include them in your daily activities. Habit five, the fifth habit that they talk about is practicing good toilet habits. So this one I think might shock some of you. Um, we want you to stop going to the toilet just in case, okay? No more just in case wheeze, all right? You should go when your bladder tells you you need to go. It's really important that we allow, allow our bladder to fill up and give us the message of fullness and then go to the toilet. If you go just in case, you're going to notice that your bladder actually might shrink and you'll have less time to go to the toilet than you used to be able to. So you can't hold as long. Um, and that could be because you've almost trained your bladder not to fill properly. So please think about that one. Um, the other thing though is for bowel motions, we want to listen to your body. So if you feel that you need to empty your bowel, go, don't wait, don't put it off. Just go when you feel that urge. That's your body's way of signaling it's time to go and it's the best time to empty your bowels. If you put it off, it's very hard to stimulate that bowel motion later. So of course we need a multidisciplinary approach um, to, to everything in life. Um, we can't just say see your GP or just see your gynae or just see your pelvic physio. Everyone has an important role to play. And if you're wondering, you know, what, a pelvic physio's role for you might be, please feel free to send me an email. You'll, you will get my details at the end of the talk. Um, and, and just ask me how I might be able to help you. But also know that we work together with GPs and gynees and counsellors and everyone else um, to, to get the best outcome for you. So what can you do on a daily basis for your pelvic floor? Well, don't be surprised, number one is your exercises. So pelvic floor exercises, two to three times a day, most days of the week, all right? And hopefully informed from a physiotherapist so that you know you're doing them correctly. For women, you may need to consider some estrogen replacement, such as a vaginal estrogen cream or in the form of a tablet. And you should discuss that with your doctor um, or if you've ever had um, you know, cancer treatment, discuss it with your oncologist. Vaginal moisturizers can really help like replens, um, especially if you're having thinning of the um, tissues around the vulva. If you're having hot flushes, consider a portable fan. They're quite easy to get your hands on these days and think about if there's any triggers and wear layers of clothing so you can strip them off as required. Men, your pelvic floor matters too. So don't 
think of this as a women's problem, um, there's so much you could be doing as well. Um, be active, so do the things you like and, and enjoy being active and outdoors. Um, and yes, of course, your diet and your fluid intake are important. So we can't deny that when we're thinking about pelvic physio, we also need to think about um, what you're putting into your body. Listen to your body, go when you need to go. That's both for wheeze and bowel motions. Go when you need to, don't go when you don't need to. Pretty simple. So I'd like to just, um, I'm gonna again, stop sharing my screen so I can have a little look at the chat box for questions. Um, and we could also possibly um, take questions without the chat just, just on if you unmute yourselves. Um, but I hope that you found the information helpful and just know that you will also receive an email tomorrow with some tips um, and my personal email that you could send me any, you know, more personal questions. So I'll just stop my share again. Let's have a little look. Um, yes, yeah, so someone's asking me whether this will be a recorded session and, and yes, so it's recorded and it will be in the, I think it's called On Demand on the Denera website. So um, yes, if, if you think it's important for one of your friends or family to watch, um, it should be available um, after today. I'm not sure when that goes up, I'd say probably tomorrow or, or so, um, but it will be available to watch again. Um, any other people who want to send through a message or ask something or any comments um, about the talk? I was thinking one of the questions I often get asked is, you know, oh, I've been incontinent for years since I had my babies. Is it really worth trying now to fix that? Um, and I would say absolutely, um, you know, all muscles can be trained and we should not have, we should not give up. So we need to try something first. Um, and even if we improve it, um, you know, by 60% or 80%, that will make a big change in your life. So don't consider it's a lifelong problem. I've just got to live with it. It absolutely isn't. We can make those changes. Oh, what a great question. So someone has asked about the psychological aspect. Does the psychological aspect impact your urgency, such as when you put your key in the door when you get home? Oh, so this is one of the major triggers for urgency. So when we think about urgency, um, people will say, it's when I put my key in the door, or it's when I wash my hands, or it's when I... Um, get home and I sit down and I can see the toilet down the, down the hallway and I can see it there and all of a sudden I have to go. So it's, it's a funny one. I don't think it's purely psychological. Um, it's actually more about your bladder and your brain and the communication between the two. And what happens is that um, in urgency, the bladder starts to decide when you're going to go and it doesn't listen to your brain telling it it's not an appropriate time right now. So um, what we need to do is essentially take the power back from the bladder and make it a conscious decision. And that takes a little bit of um, what we call bladder calming or bladder training. So it, it's quite a complex thing, but it's not psychological, but I would say it's very, very common um, to have certain triggers and particularly key in the door. That is um, definitely one of the ones we hear all the time. And if that's happening, then what we do is we train the woman just before the key goes in the door to do certain things. So we do these certain exercises before and then when they put the key in the door, they notice, oh, I'm okay now. So we catch it before the trigger to, to make sure that we're getting control back. So it, it's a little bit of a process, but it really works well. Thank you so much for joining me on your Sunday. Um, I'm happy to receive emails, so please um, email me um, anytime. And I hope you find the tip sheet helpful as well. Pop it next to your kettle or something so that it reminds you um, to do it. And thank you to Danira for giving me the, this opportunity. Um, it's really great. And I've um, really enjoyed educating everyone.